Hey everyone, my name is Sebastian, and I'm CTO and co-founder of DC Spark. And in this video, I wanted to talk about the difference between Cardano and Algorand when it comes to leader election. That is, how do you choose who makes the next block in these networks? Now, obviously, Cardano and Algorand are very different projects, but they're both proof of stake blockchains. So it's interesting to compare them and see how they're different. So two key points where they're different is that one, Cardano is UTXO based for smart contracts and Algorand is account based. But another key difference is that Cardano is Nakamoto based and Algorand is BFT based. So you might not have heard of these definitions. So let me just give you an intuition about how these are different and some of the implications because this is really key for understanding why these protocols are so different. So usually with the Nakamoto consensus from a high level point of view, it's a system where anybody can join. There's no restriction for joining the network. So for example, for Bitcoin is Nakamoto consensus named after Satoshi Nakamoto, where as long as you have a computer anywhere in the world, you can start mining Bitcoin. And if you find one, you can join the network and publish the block you found. There's no kind of committee you have to apply for or to join for. It's all open. Similarly, Cardano is also Nakamoto consensus. As long as you have ADA on the network, you can start your own stake pool and uh, delegate or delegates um, with any amount of ADA you have. So th there's no kind of committee you have to join to take part in the network. BFT protocols on the other hand tend to be run by committees. So you have a committee of 10 people and then if you want to join the committee you need to be invited to the committee by the existing members. It's kind of this kind of system. And uh, the, the goal of Algorand is to leverage this BFT model but instead make committee membership be based off token ownership in the network and, and the algo token. So this is, you, you know, the interesting approach of the Algorand blockchain trying to use BFT consensus, but still keep it decentralized using proof of stake. So what are the implications of Nakamoto consensus versus BFT? What, what does this actually change when it comes to protocols? Because this is the, the kind of understanding we, we need to have to know why these protocols are designed so differently. So first let's talk, talk about scalability. So scalability, in the Nakamoto consensus case is hard. And what I mean is that there's a reason that Cardano, Bitcoin, Ethereum all have very low transaction, transactions per second, either one digit or two digit. And that's because it's very hard to have a high scalability in a fully decentralized network. If you don't know who the members of the system are, where they're geographically located, it often means you need a lot of time to wait for any potential response and make sure that the data actually propagates through that, the throughout the entire network, no matter where the participants are located. BFT protocols, on the other hand, have a much easier time with scalability because they have usually a fixed small set of participants and you'll need to come into consensus between the small set of, of, of people. So it's much easier to uh, coordinate much lower network overhead and allows you to move much faster. And so, for example, Algorand has five digit TPS and other examples of BFT blockchains are Solana, Aptos, Sui. So usually anytime you hear a blockchain that talks about transactions per second, four digits, five digits, six digits, transactions per second, you, there's a pretty good bet that this is a BFT protocol. So what, what do you, you get from this? You get you know really good scalability, really good performance, really good latency in BFT, um, but you take a cost on safety. So usually with Nakamoto consensus, um, if you want to attack the network, you need more than 50% 50, 50 of the network, often referred to as 51% attack. Um, there's a caveat that if you have 33% of the network, there is something called selfish mining that kind of, um, you know, you can argue whether or not this is a, an attack, uh, but generally speaking, you need 50% of the network. Whereas uh, BFT protocols, if an adversary has more than 33% uh, of the stake, so one third, uh, they can usually attack the uh, protocol. So you take a, a hit in security um, on top of the decentralization of, of BFD protocols. And so that's also need to be taken into account. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is, oh yes, finality. So finality says, how long does it take for the blockchain to have confirmation that it won't revert. You won't have a rollback. The state won't be undone. In Nakamoto consensus, usually, usually you have probabilistic finality. 
And then in BFT, often you have instant or near instant. So sometimes near instant finality. So that means is that in the BFT case, for example, for example, the Algorand blockchain, once the blockchain has finalized the state, there's no way for it to roll back. And so you often hear, for example, Algorand talk about how it's a blockchain without forks where forks aren't possible. And this isn't thanks to them using the BFT system. Whereas Cardano, for example, on the other hand, and, and Bitcoin and Ethereum can roll back. So the state of the blockchain might get uh, undone. And this can be a way for people to do 51% attacks. And so that means that also if you're building a protocol on top of Cardano, you need to make sure that you wait enough time to have enough probabilistic finality. Now, this might sound really bad, but actually, um, if you assume a, an adversary has 10% adversarial stake, they own 10% of the ADA in the network, usually waiting um, 10 blocks, so about 200 seconds, will give you as, as good probabil probability of finality as you'll ever need. So obviously, you know, this is still a decent amount of time, um, but it, it's not that big in the scheme of things. And you can use solutions like Multiverse by DC Spark, which is a way to take advantage of, that, uh, of the Nakamoto consensus mechanism and the way it works to kind of give you faster finality on these, these times. Because for Nakamoto consensus, usually there's two ways to attack the network. There's a way to do an overt attack where people know you're attacking the network and a way to do a covert attack where people don't know you're attacking the network. It's much harder to pull off a covert attack. And so Multiverse uh, essentially tries to detect uh, if an overt attack is happening and assume that a covert attack is not happening. Um, and that allows you to reduce this 200 second to a much shorter time frame. It's so nice you get a good idea of the difference between BFT and Nakamoto. Now let, let's talk about how do you actually decide you know, who is the leader in, in the block selection and who gets to create um, the next block. So to do that, let me just uh, clear my canvas. Okay, so first let's let let's talk about how do we know who the participants are on the network? So it, both in Cardano and Algorand, you have addresses. So in Algorand, you have a fixed address. Keep in mind, this is the account model. So you have a fixed address, and this is the address you use all the time. In Cardano, it's the UTXO uh, model, and your addresses are actually split up into two parts. So the address for the first part is the payment key. Oops. And this payment key decides which UTXOs you can spend with a certain private key. Uh, sorry. Pay, payment key. So this payment key decides, uh, proves which UTXOs you can spend. And the second part is a staking key, which is who, how we decide who gets the staking rights, the delegation rights to any ADA stored inside these UTXOs. Now, Algorand is just a single address, a simple address. And if you want to participate in the network, the equivalent to the staking key is something that you generate as a separate thing called a participation key. Now, both the staking key and the participation key by default are not registered on the network in the sense that uh, by default, there is no participation key for an Algorand address unless you create it. And on Cardano's side, the staking key exists, but it does not actually do anything unless you actually register it. So if you ever try to delegate your ADA on Cardano, the first thing the wallet will ask you to do is it'll ask you to pay a, a two ADA deposit to register your staking key on the network so that the Cardano profile knows to track your, track your staking key and check who is delegating to, uh, who this staking key is delegating to and how much ADA is associated with this staking key. So you'll have a staking key registration. So if you use any Cardano wallet, when you want to delegate for the first time, or if you want to create a staking pool, you'll be asked to do a staking key registration, which happens on chain. Similarly for Algorand, you can generate this participation key and then you also register the staking key, or sorry, uh, you'll also have to register this participation key on chain. So from this perspective, they're fairly simple, net, uh, fairly similar. The only difference is that in an Algorand, the participation key is generated from the address, whereas in Cardano, uh, they're coupled together and the address uh, contains both things. 
So okay, so now you you've created your your staking key. Now how do you actually do something with it? Well, here's another difference between the two protocols. On Cardano, you have delegated proof of stake, which means that you have the choice between creating a stake pool yourself or delegating your ADA to somebody else. Whereas in Algorand, you have pure proof of stake, which means that there is no delegation mechanism. Uh, you cannot delegate to a stake pool. You cannot run a stake pool, but you can participate in these proof of stake protocol yourself as an individual. And so in Cardano, there's such a thing as a stake delegation, a delegation certificate similar to the staking key certificate where you, you say, I will delegate my ADA to somebody else to their stake pool. Uh, whereas in, in Elgrand, there's no such, such concept of, as delegation. Um, you are simply participating in the protocol as yourself. So, okay. So imagine you're running Cardano stake pool and you want to make blocks. How do you know if, if, you, if you're making a block? Well, Cardano is split into slots and you have epochs. And somewhere in between, there's there's blocks. So the, the concept is that slots in Cardano are one second. So every second, there's a, a new slot that gets created. And uh, these slots may or may not contain blocks. So you can have some empty slots and occasionally a slot with a block in it. And these blocks are created by stake pools. And we'll see um, later in this video when a slot is empty and when a, a slot will have a block in it and I'll make the distinction more clear. And this creation of, of blocks and slots is based off snapshots of the network state. Sorry, so every five days, an epoch is five, day, five days, um, Cardano, the network will take a new snapshot of everybody's balances and that will be used for uh, future rounds of the proof of stake model. So the system kind of evolves over time with these snapshots. Now, Algorand has a similar system, but instead of slots, they call them rounds. So you can have rounds. Some of these rounds may have blocks in them. Some of these rounds may have empty blocks in them. And instead of, of having a, a kind of more clear epoch, usually they, they say stuff like, okay, um, a thousand rounds uh, will be used to refresh the network. And so you can kind of think of this, this magic number as the equivalent of an epoch. And so, okay, so now we have a system with, with we, we have blocks, we have rounds, and now we have to talk about, well, what happens inside one epoch? What happens inside this thousand round range? How does um, the protocol behave inside this? And then once we know what happens in one epoch, know that the protocol just repeats, right? First we do epoch one, then two, then three. It's the same protocol, it just repeats over time. And that's actually where the name Ouroboros if you're curious, Cardano's proof of stake algorithm is called Ouroboros, and it's a uh, snake eating its own tail. And the reason it's called like that is because first you have Epoch 1, which feeds into Epoch 2, which feeds into Epoch 3. So that's kind of the imagery you have to have in mind to understand how this works. So, okay, so we, we want to be able to create a block, for example, on Cardano. Well, how do you do this? We want to have randomness in the protocol. For example, we want to give everybody a random chance of creating a block based on how much stake they own. So maybe if you own 10% of all of ADA, you should create 10% of all of blocks. Um, but we want this to be you know, random. You don't know which 10% you're gonna make. You just know that on average, you're gonna get around 10% of the blocks uh, made. And so there's a lot of ways to get uh, randomness inside protocols. One of them is you might've heard of MPC, which you don't need to know what this is. So don't bother pausing the video to look it up, but just know that Cardano used to use MPC. That was uh, version one of Cardano used an MPC protocol to generate randomness. And the way it worked is that all the stake pools got together, they generated a source of randomness together and then use that to feed the protocol. This is really inefficient, both in size and in computation time. And so Cardano moved to VRFs, uh, which I will explain in detail. And Algorand also uses VRFs. In fact, they were one of the pioneers, whoops. They're one of the pioneers who did uh, work on, on VRF and uh, partially uh, one of the inspirations for Cardano's protocol. And so what are these uh, VRFs? VRF stands for verifiable, random, 
function. So you want to have a way to generate random numbers that is verifiable. You can verify the random number was generated correctly. Now, if you want to know how that's possible, if you look up verifiable random functions on YouTube, you'll find a video by me that talks about the math in more detail. Um, but if you don't want to know how the math works in detail, just know that there's a way to generate random numbers where you can prove that the um, number really is random. So, okay, so we, we now we have a, a way to generate random numbers. And what we want to have is that every stick pool in Cardano has their own VRF key. And similarly, every participant inside the Algorand network will have its own VRF key. And this VRF key that you generate for your stake pool or you generate as a participant in the Algorand network will be what decides um, how you, uh, when you are able to create a block. And the key thing to note is that the VRF key has to be created ahead of time. So this VRF key you create will be uh, before this this rounds, uh, the set of rounds, uh, before this epoch, so to speak. So you'll create your VRF key, you'll submit your participation key to the network, and then uh, your verification key, um, sorry, your participation key or your VRF key will take into account into a, a future protocol, protocol execution. And same thing for Cardano. When you create your stake pool in Cardano, you do not get to participate in the proof of stake protocol right away. Uh, you have to wait a few epochs before you can actually start um, participating, participating in the protocol. And that's why if you've ever delegated to a stake pool in Cardano, you'll know that it takes, um, you know, like 10, 15 days uh, for your delegation certificate to actually come into an effect. And the reason for that is because if it was um, used right away, if you could create a VRF key and then participate right away, then you could um, wait for the epoch to start, find the key that works best for this specific epoch, and then use that. Because you're generating the VRF key ahead of time, you um, cannot kind of take advantage of this network. You have to kind of pre-commit to it in a sense. So, okay, so now we have our, our protocol and we have our VRF keys. Let me just um, clear my whiteboard again. And then we read the titles. Okay, so now we have our VRF keys for both networks. And we want to decide, okay, well, how do we know if we're actually elected to create a block for this slot, right? So as I mentioned, the, the blockchain um, has, you know, one second slots. And we want to know, are we able to make a block for this specific slot? There might be somebody elected and there might be no, nobody elected. And to understand why, um, think about how everybody has their own VRF key and the VRF key decides whether or not they are elected for a specific slot. And um, there might be just by random chance, multiple people elected for the same block. I might have a VRF key that says, oh, you're elected for this block. And somebody else might have a VRF key that also says they're elected for this block. So some blocks in Cardano or some slots in Cardano have multiple blocks posted. And conversely, some um, slots in Cardano have no blocks. Either nobody won, uh, nobody had the right VRF for that specific block, or maybe somebody had the right VRF, uh, but their state pool was offline for that time, and so there's just uh, no block for that slot. And the exact same thing applies for Algorand as well. So in Algorand, there might be nobody elected, or there might be multiple people elected. The difference is that Cardano tries to have about one person, that's the target goal, whereas Algorand tries to have many people. And so, for example, for uh, leader selection, um, Algorand defines some parameter that's equal to around 26. So they want around 26 people elected. The reason this is different is because in Cardano, you're aiming to elect a single person that makes a single block. Whereas Algorand, remember I mentioned it's a BFT protocol, so you need to elect a committee of people. So you need to select not just one person, but you need to select an entire committee. So you can say, okay, well, let's make the committee size 26, some arbitrary number, and then um, those 26 people will get together and decide, um, you know, what is the valid extension of the blockchain at that time. So that's the, the general idea. And these 26 people, um, uh, to, to, to kind of make it a bit more detail, um, they will not decide the next block per se. They'll, 26 people will propose blocks. So they'll each make a block and they'll each propose a block and then there'll be some future rounds of, with different committees that decide 
um, which block is the one that wins. And and um, I won't go into that that far into the protocol, but kind of to give you some understanding, there's 26 block proposers. And so uh, now we have an idea of how this VRF key is used, uh, but what is your probability of winning, right? So I mentioned, you know, for Algorand, we're aiming for 26 approximately. And for Cardano, we're aiming for approximately one. Well, how does that actually work? How do, how do we actually get one or how do we get to 26? But first, let's start with Cardano. And here, um, let me give you some math. And, and so that's kind of unfortunate, but th you, there'll be a, a bit of math in this presentation, but hopefully um, not so much. So keep in mind the VRF will give you a random number between zero and two to the uh, 512, generally speaking. I mean, you can, if you want, you can see this as a random number between zero and one, kind of the same idea. Um, but just understand you, you get a, a random number inside a range and you want to consider that this as this equivalent to the range, uh, zero to zero to one. And now that you have a random number from zero to one, um, you want to check in the Cardano case, whether P, which is this, this random number, this result from this VRF is less than, um, one minus one minus F. And I'll explain what all this means, uh, part of sigma. So. This is the equation that decides if you're elected for a block. And now let, let me go through this ex, uh, equation in detail so you understand all the parameters that are, that are in play. So first, what is this F parameter here? So F decides what percentage of Cardano slots should have a block. And in Cardano, this is equal to 0 0.05, so 5%. So the, the reason this happens is that uh, actually, this, this is not five percent. I think I forget if this is a percentage or just a, a value. Um, but I, you'll you'll understand the intuition. I'll probably remember remind myself the intuition as as I explain this. So the the idea of a Cardano is that if we had a block every second, if we had a block every single second, this would be too much for the protocol to handle. Keep in mind, Cardano is not BFT consensus, it's not Komodo consensus. You have people all over the world um, creating uh, blocks, and that's just too much to have one second block time. The network would get out of sync before your block reaches other people, they would already be creating their own blocks. So one second is just too fast. So the idea is that we want um, not every block to have a slot. So what we want instead is we want um, there to be around one block every 20 seconds. So every 20 seconds, you'll have one block, which means that every 20 uh, slots, um, you should have around one block. And this is approximate. So it's approximately equal. And that's what the, this F parameter decides. Um, the more you change F, the more common blocks happen. And if you go all the way to F equals one, what happens is that you have, you know, P is, is less than one minus one minus one. And then this cancels out to just um, P less than one. And remember that we said we're generating a random number from zero to one. So this means that you always got to create a block, right? So uh, don't set F equals one. You're, you're kind of setting yourself up to break the network. And so that's why F is like a fairly small number. Uh, notably right now it's 0 0.5 which corresponds to one block every 20 seconds. So next, what is this uh, term up here, the sigma term? This is deciding who, um, not deciding who, deciding how much your stake influences um, your chance of winning. So this value is also um, set between uh, zero and one, like this. So it's also a range between zero and one. Zero means that you have um, no stake in the network. And one means that you have all the ADA in the world and the network belongs entirely to you and you have all the ADA. So this sigma term um, is basically your ADA divided by all the ADA in the network. So if you have 100 ADA and there's 45 billion ADA in total, at some point, at some point in the future, it'll be 45 billion. Um, that would be the value of sigma. So let's see what happens um, when sigma is equal to 
one. So you let, let's see what happens when you have all the, the A dot in the network. Um, now you have P is less than one minus one minus 0 0.05 to the power of one, which means one minus uh, 0 0.95 to the power of one, um, which is equal to uh, 0 0.05. Right, and so, so this is what happens when you have uh, sigma is equal to one. Now, what happens when you have um, sigma is instead equal to zero? Now you have uh, one minus, so keep in mind anything to the power of zero is one, so it's equal to one, and then now you have this is zero so p has to be less than zero which means that you never make a block right so you can see that um if you set this to one you get f as the value and that's your your ch your chance of making the block and if you have zero as the value if you have no eight in the system you have no chance of making a block right so um this gives you some idea of of how it works and so basically what you do is every single time there's a a block in the network you somehow include the information about that block inside your VRF. You run your VRF for that specific slot. You check the result of this equation. And if you win the equation, then you get to propose a block for that slot. Now, there might be two people elected for the same block, as I mentioned. And this is sometimes called in Cardano a slot battle, which is what it means when there's two different state pools elected for the same block. And usually what happens in this case is you want to have a tiebreaker. And I believe the tiebreaker right now is just lowest value. Um, but I don't remember right now. I remember it changed fairly recently in the last epoch. Uh, the behavior has changed slightly. Um, but you can just have any kind of arbitrary tiebreaker, whatever you prefer, um, just to, to um, decide who gets to be the real uh, block maker for that slot. And when I say lowest value, I think it's the, the lowest VRF value. So you take this VRF, you take the lowest value. So um, you basically have a tiebreaker and that chooses who has the um, block for that slot. Now, what happens on Algorand? So Algorand is really different because you don't ha want to have this kind of um, tiebreaker for a single person. You instead want to have 26 people elected. Uh, and, and how do you choose who these people are? So the idea is that, again, you run your VRF. And again, this will give you a number between zero and one. And keep in mind, this time we want this VRF to uh, not choose and be a single person, but instead choose a committee of 26. And how do we how do we accomplish that? The way we do it is we take this VRF output as a position on a range from zero to A, where we're going to say A is the amount of algo you have. Okay, so if you have a million algo, this will be from zero to a million. And you want this, this range to represent how many algo you have actually is like a, a winning ticket, if you will. So if you think about the Cardano case, um, all your ADA is treated the same. It all gets grouped together into this one sigma term, and that's all that really matters. On Algorand, it's... Uh, better to visualize it, to, to think of it as you do like a lottery where every single algo you have is a lottery ticket. So if you have five algo, you have five lottery tickets. And the idea is that um, T of these lottery tickets um, will be winning ones. So you have 26 over the total number of algo in existence. And that's the number of tickets that that will win. So um, this is your chance of having a winning ticket. And you want to have a Bernoulli distribution that chooses how many winning tickets you have. And if you don't know what that distribution is, um, let me kind of give you an idea. So imagine you have a lottery system and you have a 25% chance of winning the lottery and you, you play twice. You, you, you do two plays of this lottery system. You have two cases, sorry, four cases. You might win twice. 
You might win and then lose. You might lose and then win. And you might lose and lose. So the chance you win twice is 25% times 25%. The chance you win and then you lose is 25% times 75. The chance you lose and win is 75, 25. And the chance that you lose twice is 75, 75. So this kind of gives you a probability distribution. And if you look, calculate how that looks, you'll notice that the um, buckets are, are not of even length. Um, so it's not like, um, you know, this is your chance of um, once, twice, and zero. It's, it, they're not evenly separated. Instead, what you get is some that has a large bucket of zero and a slightly smaller bucket of one, sm an even smaller bucket of two, an even smaller bucket of three, all the way on until you get a really small bucket of just A. And so if you run the numbers, this is what you'll end up seeing if you run this kind of distribution. So the question is, if you have A algo, like if you have a million algo, how many of these are winning tickets? Um, the chance that you get uh, three winning tickets is your chance that your VRF lands in this tiny section over here. So keep in mind this VRF gives you a number to one, uh, a zero to one. So you consider zero this position here. You consider one this position here. And if you get 0 0.5, you'd be like halfway through, which in this example, you'd be at two. So you'd get two winning lottery tickets. And by setting um, you know, this as the probability distribution, you will end up with about 26 people who win the election and who then uh, become the block producers or the block proposers rather for that specific round. And again, because this is all probability based, you might have less than 26, you might have more than 26. Um, and it's shown that in, in the algorithm paper that the chance that you get um, zero people is, is basically negligible. And for any reasonable probability, you'll get around one to 70 people. So you might have some rounds with one person elected and only one. You might get some rounds with 70 people elected and, and uh, uh, you'll have to figure out what happens. So the question is, okay, so you get a bunch of people, but then how do you um, do the tie breaking um, between them? So you have 26 people, for example, elected, uh, but just like Cardano, there can only be one actual block. There, at, at the end of the day, there has to be one person. So what you do is imagine that you win twice. You take the hash of the VRF output with the number of times you've won. So for in our example, uh, whoops, we won once, uh, and then we won a second time. So we take the VRF output concatenated by one, and then the VRF output con concatenated by two. And we take the largest of these two values and that's what we submit out to the chain. So everybody who's elected does this and then you take the highest values and that's the person that wins the block. Now, here's another difference between Cardano and Algorand, which is that on Cardano's side, once you've created your block, you publish it and you walk away and you're done. Whereas in Algorand's side, the protocol continues. So once you've done this whole protocol and you find the block producers and you select which block got the highest value. Next, you have to do more rounds of voting and each round of voting reruns VRFs with new people. And so the idea is that first you um, decide the block producers, Oops. block producers, and then you vote on who wins the block producers. And then you do a soft vote to, um, try and gain larger agreement on who, uh, which block is win has won and with that block is valid. And then lastly, you do a certify vote to get the final result. And the idea is that every time you do the, this round, you become more and more certain of the result with a larger and larger committee of people. Uh, but each time you do this kind of soft vote, certify vote and finalization of the protocol, you rerun this VRF step um, and you have a different output. So the difference is in Cardano, you're you're running a, a single VRF um, on the kind of block information for the block you're creating, but in in the Algorand case, the VRF takes in a role 
as one of the arguments and it depending on, on what role you have you'll get a, a different number from zero to one so for example you would run your vrf one for the block producer role run your vrf again for the soft certify which might have multiple rounds inside it so you might run with role soft one soft two soft three certify one and so on and so there might be multiple times that you're elected for different roles inside the same uh, single ex block execution of the protocol. And so this is kind of overall the difference um, between the two protocols. Um, there's a few other points that I didn't mention, especially after the block gets created, how do you validate blocks and, and so on. Uh, but two other things I, I did want to mention. So first of all is that uh, the source of randomness for the VRF is decided once every epoch for Cardano and a thousand rounds for Algorand. So when you're running a, a block for Algorand, you're referring to the randomness randomness sets at the last epoch. And same thing for Cardano, where you're running this VRF, you're running based off the randomness of previous epochs. Um, and so you have occasionally a, a regeneration or refreshing of the randomness for these protocols. And the last thing I mentioned is that in both these protocols, you want to get rid of long range attacks by having people accidentally keep their private keys um, that they use to create blocks. Um, so the, the way you avoid this and the reason this is an issue is because imagine I run a stake pool for a year and I create a bunch of blocks. And then I, I at some point decide to sell all my algo or sell all my ADA. I might as well also sell my private key for my stake pool. Um, but if, if I do this, then this is actually attacking the network because somebody can use my stake king key for my stake pool and use this to try and attack the path of the blockchain by creating new and different kinds of, of blocks using my uh, key. And to avoid this, Cardano uses a system called KES, Key Evolving Signatures. So as you make blocks on the Cardano network, your key evolves over time so that even if you uh, retire your stake pool and you stop making blocks, you no longer have the keys to blocks you created in the past. And the way Algorand handles this is that the participation key is actually creating multiple ephemeral keys uh, that you use in these, these rounds. And these ephemeral keys get deleted as well um, once the round is done. So that's the another kind of difference I wanted to mention, but you know, similar in concept. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the difference between the two protocols. They're both very interesting in their own way. They both have trade-offs. And uh, now you can potentially go on and, and learn more about proof of stake protocols and different ones that exist out there that potentially work very differently. Or you can use this knowledge to help uh, dig deeper into either Cardano or Algorand and get deeper into those communities, both of which are exciting in their own way. So thank you very much for your time. And if you like this kind of content, subscribe, let us know below and let us know what kind of educational content you'd like to see in the future.